So Russia has cut gas to Germany, partially, and cut gas to the Netherlands, right? Now, let, let's take a look at how this works, because um, a lot of people think that, you know, <laughs> uh, Germany's economy is going to crumble all of, a uh, all of a sudden because there's no more gas coming in. I mean, that would certainly be the case if, if Russia really turned off the valves, but that's not what happened. Uh, here is the headline from Business Insider. It says, Russia's Gazprom which is the state-owned gas company. Russia's Gazprom cuts off some natural gas to Germany after Shell refused to pay for it in rubles. So uh, just for context, Shell is a British oil company, British energy company. But uh, what's going on here is that, um, you know, I, I, I explained all of this to you. On, in the last week of March, uh, the Russian president, Vladimir Putin, he basically said to all the quote-unquote unfriendly countries, which includes a lot of the EU, he told them, listen, if you, want to, if you want Russia to keep sending you gas, you better pay in rubles, in our currency, right? Why should we take your dollars and your euros, uh, you know, which you can freeze at any moment? And uh, on top of it, you know, we're basically shoring up your currency. We're, at, we're adding value to your currency. No, 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 this is going to change. And so what's happened now is that you've, have, you've had some countries in the last month and a half that have looked at the situation and said, you know what, fine, we'll, we'll go and pay you in rubles. And others that have straight up said no, okay? And in this case, companies that have said no, which includes Shell. Now, I have a whole video explaining how this process works about paying in rubles. Because it, it, it doesn't mean that, you know, Germany has to go buy rubles and send them. That's not how it works. They actually send euros. And then uh, Gazprom Bank changes them into rubles. There, there's a whole video on that, which I really, really recommend you watch because I lay it out very simply. Um, in, in any case, going back to what, what's just happened. Russian energy giant Gazprom has completely halted natural gas supply to Shell. Okay. And um, the move came after Shell refused to pay Gazprom in rubles. So they actually posted uh, the announcement on, on Telegram uh, when it comes to uh, Shell, right? And uh, on, the, on, the, on their ter Telegram channel. And again, basically in the article, they're explaining what I just told you about, uh, about the payment system. And this is important. Gazprom supplies up to 1.2 billion cubic meters of natural gas a year to Shell. So that's only 1.3% of the 95 billion cubic meters of natural gas that Germany consumes each year. Okay, so just to be clear, they're, they're only, quote-unquote, only cutting off 1.3% of what Germany consumes in a year. So it's not that significant. But I, I, I want to be clear, um, when you're dealing with things like energy shortages, um, even if it's 1%, it's 2%, it, it has a ripple effect. It certainly has a ripple effect. So I wouldn't just shrug it off as, oh, it doesn't mean anything. No, it's, it's, uh, it's certainly important. But um, the, the two companies in Germany that, that are the huge importers, the main importers of Russian gas, it's these two, Uniper and uh, DWE, okay? So these are the major natu natural gas importers. And they have agreed to pay Russia under this new payment plan, Okay. So this is, again, according to Reuters from yesterday, uh, May 31st, and they say that German companies, Uniper, and uh, I don't want to say Rewe because that's a completely different German company, but RWE, they, they have paid for Russian gas under a new scheme proposed by Moscow, okay? And uh, they say Germany greatly depends on Russian gas, which accounted for more than half of all imports of the fuel last year, and uh, uh, Uniper and RWE... Two major German importers of Russian gas have said that they would establish accounts in Russia in line with current sanctions, okay? So you, you see down here, they say that Uniper pays in euros, okay? And um, they're also, the, the spokespersons for these energy companies are saying that they've paid in euros. Why are they saying this? I'll tell you why, because um, first of all, this is PR. You know, they're going out and saying, yes, we paid the Russians in euros. So it doesn't look like, you know, they're, they're uh, being, uh, you know, they're bending the knee to Putin, right? They don't want to look like they're, they're doing Russia's bidding. You know how the press is right now. It's a bit wild. But um, uh, again, the way this works, you, you continue sending euros, but you have to open an account in Gazprom Bank um, and then they convert it to rubles. Now, 
at the same time, look at what happened. So Russia has cut off natural gas supply to the Netherlands. Okay, because they refuse to pay in rubles. And this is, again, this is from today, June 1st. So, uh, the company that, that imports natural gas from Russia in the Netherlands is called Gas Terra. Okay, and they published this statement on their website over here, um, where they say that Gas Terra will not go along with Gazprom's payment demands. Okay, they published that on 30th of May. And uh, they, they say um, on their website that they have decided not to comply with Gazprom's one-sided payment requirements. Okay. Uh, Gazprom declared to discontinue supply with effect from 31st of May 2022. So now the question is, okay, well, if they're, they're cutting off gas to the Netherlands, how does this affect the Netherlands? Like how much Russian gas do they actually import? So down here in the same press release, they say the secession of supply by Gazprom means that between now and 1st of October 2022, the date on which the contract ends, approximately 2 billion uh, cubic meters of contracted gas will not be delivered, okay? And Gas Terra has anticipated this by buying gas from other providers. So, um, I went and I looked on, uh, I looked up how much, uh, you know, how much natural gas the Netherlands consume in a year. And it's about 40 billion cubic meters. So if the Russians through gas terror were going to give the Dutch 2 billion cubic meters and the, nat the, the, the yearly consumption is 40 billion cubic meters, well, then that means it's about 5%. So basically the, the, the Dutch have lost roughly 5% of their natural uh, gas needs for this year. But again, they're saying that they've bought... Um, gas elsewhere they've stocked up supplies elsewhere okay so just a moment you can see here in general okay they say that uh, uh, this is in business insider that the netherlands relies on russia for about 15 percent of its gas supplies that's according to reuters but the, uh, what I'm talking about is specifically this contract where they say it's 2 billion, okay? But generally speaking, uh, the Dutch get 15% of their gas supplies from, from the Russians. And, you know, the, the, the next question is, what about Denmark? Denmark, I'm pretty sure that tomorrow morning, uh, if, if not now, the Russians will announce Gazprom will say we cut off gas to Denmark because Denmark are doing the same thing. They're saying we're not going to pay. We're not going to use your new uh, uh, payment system, okay? I, I honestly think this is childish. I, I, I really think this is childish, and I'll tell you why. Because if you go watch the video where I explain how this uh, ruble payment system works, no, the Russians are not telling uh, the, the Dutch or the Germans to send rubles. They're telling them, keep sending us the exact same amount in euros or whatever we agreed in, agreed upon. But you have to open a, a bank account in Gazprom Bank, one for euros and one for rubles, okay? So keep sending the euros, and then Gazprom Bank will take your euros, sell them in exchange for rubles, and then make the payment. So I, I, I really, you know, this is basically the best of, of both worlds. Everybody gets to save face. You know, the, the, the <laughs> unfriendly countries, as Russia's calling them, um, the Germans, the Dutch, and so on, they get to keep paying in euros or whatever they agreed, uh, agreed in. And the Russians get to shore up the value of their currency, which took a hit as a result of the sanctions. And, you know, everybody's happy. So I, 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 don't, know, <laughs> I don't know why they're doing this. And it, it's, kind of, it's kind of silly because, you know, the EU basically made contradictory statements. At first they said, well, no, this payment system, you cannot, you cannot abide by it because it would violate the sanctions against Russia. That's not true. And, and it's not me saying that. The EU themselves, they came out and put out this uh, paper saying that actually after looking at it, no, it would not violate the EU sanctions on Russia. So we, we looked at that together, right, uh, a few weeks ago. And uh, you can see here, this is from the Washington Post, uh, published on May 24th. The headline reads, Europe accepts Putin's demands on gas payments to avoid more shutoffs, right? So um, European energy companies appear to have bent to Russian President Vladimir Putin's demand that they purchase natural gas using an elaborate new payment system, 
a concession that avoids more gas shutoffs and also gives Putin a public relations victory while continuing to fund his war effort in Ukraine. Again, this is this is really childish. It's not about PR. It's it's about the ruble. But in any case, um, you know, they, they, they tell you everything that I've already explained to you. Um, and then down here. They say Russia had already used strict capital controls and a massive interest rate, a rate hike to stabilize the ruble. With Europe now signaling, signaling that it will use the payment system as bills come due this week, the currency is strengthening all the more. You guys remember we looked at the value of the ruble, I don't know, just last week. It, man, it was ridiculous. It was like 62 rubles to the dollar. And when, when I wasn't streaming, I was offline. I looked at it again. It was 57. 57. To, to the dollar. I'm, I, I wonder what it is today, honestly. Just, let's take a look. Um, 63. That's, that's the current value that we have over here. So, right now, as of June 1st, it's 63 rubles to the dollar. Okay? In any case, uh, uh, going back to the article. Um, there you go. So, so, this professor at Rome's Lewis University says that, quote, this is a transaction where everybody saves face. Thank you. This is true. He, he is right when he says this. This is absolutely true. That's the whole point. <laughs> there you go. So two European Union members, Poland and Bulgaria, had their supplies cut in late April by Gazprom after refusing to go along with the new system, right? And Finland this week was subject to a similar cutoff as retaliation for its NATO application. And I'm not sure that's 100% correct. They, anyway, um, most European countries have appeared to go a different route, moving away from rhetoric about refusing to be blackmailed and making peace with an arrangement based on the technicalities. Okay, so Austria's uh, oil and gas company, OMV, said that timely payment for the received gas deliveries from Russia is insured. Remember, uh, Austria gets 80%, roughly 80% of its uh, gas from Russia. <laughs> they really don't have a choice. You know, Russia's got them by the balls, so to speak. Um, and here, this is, this is important. This, this is what I told you a few minutes ago. Along the way, many European policymakers have been confused about the arrangement, both the fine points and whether Russia might stand to gain anything meaningful. As such, the EU's own guidance on how countries should proceed has been vague. Yeah, so as recently as last week, uh, Eric Mammer, the European Commission's chief spokesman, said opening an account for rubles would constitute a breach of sanctions. And then a day later, uh, Paolo Gentiloni, the, uh, uh, so Europe's economic minister, seemed to give the new payment scheme an all clear. He said paying in rubles would constitute in sanction, a sanctions violation, but this is not what is happening. <laughs> okay, uh... You know, thanks for the clarity. In any case, um, so here, this is important because uh, any, which is the Italian company, okay, they've also decided they, they'll open an account for the ruble conversion, right? And um, as we talked about, Uniper, they've also agreed to it, the German one. And here's a very important point. So Alexander Novak... Russia's deputy prime minister said last week that about half of Gazprom's 54 foreign clients have opened ruble accounts. Wow. That's more than I thought. Although it, it, may, it makes sense, right? It makes sense. So, I mean, right now, uh, if we do a quick count, I mean, we've got Italy, Germany, Austria, uh, Slovakia, Hungary... And of course, you know, in the, within those countries, you have multiple clients. You have multiple gas companies. Uh, Austria only has OMV, I believe, which is trading with Gazprom. But then when it comes to Germany, we have RWE um, and Uniper, for example. Any is the Italian one and so on. Um, right, so gas is the biggest issue, okay? Just to recap, the EU have banned Russian coal. They're going to get rid of you know, 90% of their oil imports from Russia by the end of the year. That's the plan, at least. But with gas, it's a whole other issue, as you can see. Very, very big. Each country, and within each country, you have different decisions coming from uh, gas companies. As we just saw, for example, Shell in Germany says, we don't want to open this ruble account. 
and, Ga and, and Russia says, Gazprom says, well, okay, then we're not sending you any more gas. And so Germany loses 1.3% 1, 1. of its um, consumption, right? But at the same time, Uniper, for example, which is one of the larger um, natural gas importers, says, no, we will open the account. So I don't think that this is a breach of sanctions. I, I'll tell you why, because um, first of all, they're still paying in euros, right? They're not paying in rubles. Uh, and they're still paying in dollars. M most of the contracts are in, are in euros, but there are some in dollars, if I'm not mistaken. And uh, my point is that they literally don't have a choice, right? They just don't have a choice because, the you know, European countries depend so much on Russian gas imports. They don't have a choice. They cannot just say, oh, yeah, we're going to turn off, uh, you know, our, uh, uh, um, you know, we're just going to stop paying you tomorrow and you can turn off the valves. Do you know what would happen to the economy? I, I really think people don't, fully, you know, uh, uh, grasp how, how related uh, the energy supplies are to the rest of the economy. I mean, it devastates everything if you, you have a seismic shift like that from one day to the next. Uh, agriculture, industry, services, it all goes down the drain. So you cannot do that. That it, It's, it's um, <laughs> as much as they would love to, right? As much as they would love to. And sometimes I really question what they're doing because I feel like they're ready to, to destroy everything. The, the European uh, bureaucrats just to you know, uh, um, to kiss Uncle Sam's backside, to put it mildly, right? You know, if things go sour, again, they're not the ones that pay for it. Literally, literally. But uh, that's very interesting. So th the Russians are saying about half of their 54 clients, uh, foreign clients, have, have agreed to open the account. There you go. And when it comes to Italy, I want to show you this. This is from Al Jazeera. So uh, Italian energy giant Eni signs deal to boost Algerian gas supply, okay? So this is from last week, from 26th of May. Italian energy giant Eni and Algeria's state-owned Sonatra have reached agreement to boost both gas exploration and the development of green hydrogen in the North African nation, as Rome seeks new ways to reduce its reliance on Russian hydrocarbons, okay? So again, this is part of the whole mantra and mindset, like, yeah, we want to... Uh, wean ourselves off of run Russian energy. So uh, here they say Italy, which sourced around 40% of its gas imports from Russia last year, has been scrambling to diversify its energy supply mix as Russia's conflict in Ukraine escalates. Diversifying away from Russia is the main reason behind attempts to accelerate the development of gas fields in Algeria. Algeria, which is Italy's second, second biggest gas supplier last year after Russia, has been pumping Algerian gas to Italian shores since 1983 through the Trans-Mediterranean Pipeline, which runs to Sicily. So, again, th this, these are the things we're seeing. And, again, um, when we look at the countries that have been cut off, let's count them. We have Bulgaria, we have Poland, Germany in part, uh, the Netherlands, Finland, and probably Denmark by tomorrow. So, in the case of Poland, which got about 50% of its gas from Russia, that's a different story. And I did a whole video on that explaining to you all the different pipelines and how much, you know, how many billions of cubic meters, uh, there, you know, Poland is going to get from them. So, uh, definitely watch that if you want to get a good idea of, of what Poland is going to do next. But that was a different, um, uh, uh, I feel like Poland is kind of a special case because usually a country <laughs> that cuts off 50% of its gas supply, uh, you know, that, that's, that's trouble. But uh, again, when you have enough reserves, you have alternatives, uh, I suppose it, it can work. In any case, def definitely go watch that video. Uh, we went into detail on that. But this is the situation right now. And I think I'll just finish by reading you uh, this article from oilprice.com. This is published on May 25th. The headline says how sanctions have increased Russia's oil and gas revenue. So the, the author says, as I warned in my February article, Russia could potentially benefit from the sanctions on its oil exports. Russian sanctions would be put in place, potentially reducing the available oil supply in a tight market. If Russia could still sell the oil it could produce to countries that refuse to abide by the sanctions, it might do well financially with an oil price spike. We now have data in hand to confirm that the sub subsequent sanctions on Russia's oil are in fact boosting Russia's oil revenues. So look at this. Pay attention to this. Russia's oil and gas revenues 
hit another record high in April. 1.8 trillion rubles in a single month after 1.2 trillion in March. So after only four months, Russia's federal budget has now already received 50% of the planned oil and gas revenue for 2022. This is according to Janis Kluge on, on, uh, on Twitter, right? Let me go to his post, actually. Maybe you can see it a bit better over here, okay? So he, w what is he sourcing? He's sourcing the, um, the figures from the Russian government, okay? <laughs> and I can, I can immediately see the comment underneath this. They're asking him... Uh, can you can you rely on the Russian numbers, right? It's off a Russian regierungsseite, so a regime website. Derzeit mit Tatsachen zu rechnen. So yeah, they're basically questioning the figures if those figures are real. Oh baby, I think they're real. <laughs> I think they're real. Again, I just walked you through how how much um, how how dependent Europe is on Russian gas and oil. And on top of it, you can look up the prices. Anybody can just go on Google right now and look up the prices of of Brent. And, and uh, you know, we were live when they were going up by the minute. I mean, it was insane, right? So where are we again right now? I think it's $113 um, uh, per barrel on Brent today after uh, the, uh, you know, the EU has said it's going to sanction 90% of Russian oil imports. So, I mean, I'm, I think the figures are accurate. There's, there's, it's not something far-fetched. And this is nuts. So just to put this into, per into perspective again... Russia, you know, every, every country, they, they set out a budget and they, they have projections. They, they say that, okay, for 2022, um, our estimate is that we will make X amount of rubles from uh, energy sales, okay? And Russia's already reached 50% of those expected sales in the first four months. I mean, by, by any, you know, by any metric, that's quite an, uh, an achievement. And how is that uh, done? It's because, again... Uh, despite Russia selling less, the prices have gone through the roof, so they've made more money. Again, just complete idiocy from these bureaucrats in Washington and the EU. They're just so dumb. Uh, you know, and, and when I, I want to be very clear. When Russia makes more money, you know, when the, when the price of oil and gas is higher, who do you think is paying that? It's the consumer. Do you understand? It's the consumer, and that's why... You see things like this, which one of you guys uh, were kind enough to send me, uh, send in to me. And this was taken in Eureka, California. Again, just look at this. Look at these prices. I mean, th this is just stunning, honestly. Look at that. Six, seven dollars a gallon? Am I hallucinating? Did I read that correctly? I, f <laughs> I feel like I'm not reading that correctly. This is why. Okay, th so again, it it's not the only reason. We, you know, we, we can't say that... Uh, the, the war in Ukraine is the only reason that the prices are higher. But to say that it's, you know, not connected, this is a flat-out lie. That's a flat-out lie. And I love it when Biden, what does he call it? He calls it Putin's price hike. You know, as if Putin sat down and said, you know what? Let's charge $50 extra per barrel. No, dummy. It's your sanctions. It's your EU sanctions and US sanctions that caused the global oil prices to go up. Ironically, ironically, Russia has been selling oil to India at a discount. They've been buying it for like $60, $70 a barrel. <laughs> I mean, that would be good with, with you know, in peacetime already, with, with no war. Oh, man, they, they're really dirty, Putin's price hike. I mean, you don't have to like the guy, but that's just a, that's just a flat-out lie. That's a flat-out lie. That's You did that. You did that. You... Uh, threatened to ban Russian um, oil imports, and then you banned Russian oil imports, and both of those events caused the prices to go up. And now the EU has done the same thing today. They've done the same thing today, banning Russian oil imports, and the prices go up and up. And again, who pays for that? It's the consumer. It's right there. Who, who do you think is paying for it? The money, you know, Russia's getting paid by aliens? Obviously, someone is paying for it. It's coming out of somebody's pocket. The, the difference, though, is then... The difference, though, is that when those, you know, politicians roll up to the gas station in their nice limousines, they're not the ones paying for it. As a matter of fact, they wouldn't even roll up to the gas station. Their driver will go, their chauffeur will go fill up the tank for them, right? For, and their Mercedes Benzes and their Lincolns. <laughs> oh, man. 
They really got some dishonest tactics. In any case, as always, I'm bringing you the latest on everything to do with Ukraine uh, and outside Ukraine. L look how much of a ripple effect this war is having uh, on global energy prices. Uh, it's just, it's fascinating. Uh, very regrettable, you know. We, I think we all wish that this war would have never happened in the first place. Except maybe the weapons manufacturers. But, you know, uh, uh, again, just fascinating how, how much it's affecting the, the, the planet um in every domain so of course i'll keep you updated uh as um as uh more news comes in but as of june 1st uh this is where we are